one question, tokenmetrics, I think you were the one that said that DeFi is going to be like pushing and, and somehow are, is going to make to force evolution on the part of the, you know, all like the normal finances, right? Central, uh, mm -hmm. Centralized finances. Uh, Leo, Greg, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, let's start with Leo. What, how do you see this issue? Uh, how long I, is it going to take for centralized finances to really, I, I mean, in just traditional, right? Finances start to actually respond instead of just like pushing governments to ban or to do stuff to DeFi and blockchain, when are they going to eat? Will they do something or will they just try to just exercise power and, and quiet uh, the DeFi voices? Greg, please. Sure. And then Leo, oh. please. Is that yeah, okay? Go ahead, Gregor. Sorry yeah. about that. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I, 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 don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a DeFi versus uh, CeFi um, question per se. Um, I think the, the two worlds in that sense or concepts are, are here to stay. Um, but I, I definitely think um, DeFi today um, has shown uh, to the C5 world or well, yeah, or mm -hmm. DC5 world um, kind of the potential, right? I mean, we have not, not just from a, from a um, conceptual perspective that things are not under a, someone's control, Um, but also from a from an efficiency perspective, um, you can just build new products that you have never been able to build before, and and this is especially in the financial world. It is it is a game changer. It is a game changer for you know for a lot of people, uh, specifically living in emerging markets. I mean that's our focus. Uh, we are we are seeing most of our users uh, down the road. Uh, you know average people um, on the streets in emerging markets who now have like five, six dollars in an e-wallet and can't really do much with it. Um, and and that's, that requires a different infrastructure and, and um, set up behind uh, of what uh, CFI could do today. But I really think uh, a little bit further down the road, uh, there will be a, a lot of hybrid products. There are products, uh, I, I think of an example in the insurance space, Um, you do need an uh, insurance company for certain types of insurances, but why not leverage DeFi to underwrite um, some of that, uh, some of those insurance policies? Mm. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of um, overlap uh, between the two concepts, um, but I definitely, uh, I, I think DeFi right now has to also overcome some Um, challenges in terms of acceptance from regulators. Uh, I mean, there is the big topic of you know consumer protection law uh, under which all the all the CFI companies have to adhere to. That's not there in DeFi, um, but definitely uh, I, I think we are still super super early. Um, and to put things probably in perspective, if crypto is is still very early in the big scheme of things in the <laughs> world, uh, DeFi is, is is like super super early. Right? Yeah. I mean, baby, yeah. Leo, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it's um, the topic was, you know, C5 versus DeFi um, or TradFi, you know, mm. how do traditional finance companies and, and industries react to DeFi? And I, I really agree with uh, Gregor on this about the, the hybrid approach where, you know, I don't think DeFi is uh, meant to replace traditional finance, but more trying to, trying to bridge it, right? How do we encourage these traditional companies, you know, these Visas, these JP Morgans that, hey, if you move into blockchain technology, into crypto, into DeFi, you can actually increase your profits, lower your costs and things like that. Um, you know, ex an example I like is, is like a Uniswap versus a Coinbase. You know, Uniswap is like what, just 20 people, but they do almost as much volume as Coinbase and Coinbase has like 500 employees. And you know, that's just kind of an example of how crypto and DeFi can scale at such massive levels that traditional technology, traditional processes cannot. And so I think once um, you know, we get the regulations right, we get the, the UX is really big too. I think, I think for retail users, it should feel like you're just using another banking app, another Venmo app, a Robinhood app. Um, they don't have to know they're using blockchains under the hood if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part too. So, so just to kind of summarize, I think you know, we're not trying to kill off companies in crypto or DeFi. We're trying to get these companies to use DeFi to merge this tech into their own tech. So that's how I see it. Mm, nice, nice. 
Yeah, can I react to that? Machine. Oh, uh, did um, a token metrics have a comment? Please go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah please. Yeah, I would like to react. I think actually, um, I think both Greg and Lee were interesting points, but I think both of them are actually really understating um, sort of the impact that DeFi is going to be having. So um, the way I see it, sort of um, crypto and these wallets, I mean, it's not just a way, it's sort of like another smart way of, of, of routing payments. I mean, why do we need that? We have Venmo, we have that these things work. There are fint tradition, TradFi fintechs that do payments well. That is not the fundamental difference. I think the fundamental difference is uh, that co it, it comes with a decentralization and trustlessness. The fact that current banks, I mean, let's not let's not be be wrong about it. Like they're they're already doing blockchains. Like there are they they've developed blockchains that are running between uh, the the major banks. It's not that they can't do that. It's not that they're not doing it. It's the fact that what we're doing in DeFi is um, fundamentally different from what they're doing because what they're doing their main business model is um, they're printing money through creating loans, and that's what's not possible in like that's like sort of like it's. Like sort of like this this element of sort of like um, of of trust in, that you need in order for that to work that that's really hard to 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 put put a put up in in a trustless system. So I mean, of course, you could set it up, but sort of like it really goes sort of against the against the logic. Like, why would you put something if you have the, all those trustless protocols? Why would you put something in a protocol where you need to have trust? So right now, we all do trust it the banking system. So if you want to buy a house, you you. Sort of like you might have your uh, your account at uh, Chase Bank, and you sort of like you're happy to receive your payment as as a deposit at Chase Bank, which is technically a liability of Chase Bank, and Chase Bank could actually default on that liability. So there are backups in place in the U.S. There's the FDIC. So if sort of like if you're seeing that really something happened to Chase Bank, you could go to the FDIC and get your money back. But honestly, this, this is all like these, these are patches. They're sort of like they're patching a system that is fundamentally not as stable, not as safe as DeFi. And I think I think people this is this is sort of like the this, this fundamental paradigm shift will really challenge banks' business models. I also think that, that they're sort of like they're all already doing blockchain. I think they're just too large and too sort of like um, monolithic and kind of like too used to having this 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 this, this, this little competition. They're sort of like they're, it's really hard for them to compete in terms of innovation and the speed of innovation that the DeFi is bringing to this space. But there's really like a, a much more fundamental challenge to their business model, and I think that's what people are currently sort of um, not really appreciating yet, and sort of like I'm like. There are these regulatory debates. Um, I'm like sort of like I, I know there are people in that space who understand that problem, but I don't think those are the voices that are sort of like pushing out the the, 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 the push for regulation. It's sort of like hmm. push against DeFi, sort of like just sort of like in parallel with the push against crypto, which is sort of yeah. like um, we we like it's, it's too anonymous, dude. It could be used for for illicit purposes, whatever. It's sort of like I don't think they see this like sort of like the fundamental economic aspect is, is has yet come through. And I think it's it's maybe it's a good thing because sort of like it allows us to develop these protocols further. So um, when we say it's trustless, sort of like, I mean, that's, it's, it's some of them is no more because no protocol is truly trustless unless you trust the code. I mean, how many people actually check the code? I actually audit the code right. themselves. So we need this time now to sort of like to build these products to make them really safe and secure. We have trusted standards before we can sort of like, before we can really trust uh, the, the mainstream to sort of like, um, expect the mainstream to sort of like really believe us that that, that it's sort of like it's, it's now become a trustless system. But I think once this is in place, um, it's sort of like we're like we would there will be regulations, but like I mean the genie is out of the bottle, and like we it's not it's, it's never worked to turn back the the the, the era of, of sort of like of innovation. It's it's sort of like it's it's <laughs> once it's out of the bottle, like there's no reason why you would want the custodial wallet other than that you don't have no alternative, right? 